Tomorrow will mark exactly one month since WWE's Black Wednesday, when the company fired or furloughed a reported 40% of its staff. Worst month anniversary ever! While those released from the main roster were confirmed on a statement on WWE.com, the producers, writers, and NXT wrestlers let go were never officially confirmed, which means we're still discovering new releases even now, as those affected make their own announcements on social media. And now we've got another name to add to the very long list. It's come out that the daughter of WWE Hall of Famer and former manager of AOP Paul Ellering, Rachel Ellering, was also fired during the batch of NXT releases last month. Ellering, who wrestled under the name Rachel Evers during both May Young Classic tournaments and worked several matches on NXT, has tweeted a video announcing her comeback. The NXT wrestlers released last month will be able to work where they like starting from tomorrow, as they had a 30-day no-compete clause as opposed to the main roster's 90-day term. Unfortunately, not only has the non-WWE wrestling scene been flooded with talent, very few wrestling promotions are actually running shows during total lockdown. Possibly not even WWE themselves with one of their traditional big four. SummerSlam is currently scheduled to take place on August 23rd, but despite it being over three months away, WWE's plans for the show are in turmoil, as the biggest party of the summer might actually have to be rebranded as the moderately sized get-together of the fall. According to the very reliable WrestleVotes, WWE wants to hold SummerSlam in their already announced venue, the TD Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Not in the WWE Performance Center, as how they've done with wrestling. WrestleMania and Money in the Bank since total lockdown began. And they also want fans to be in attendance. Problem is, the city of Boston has banned all large-scale gatherings until Labor Day in September, so they can't do that. WrestleVotes claim WWE is actively hunting for a new location for the event, so it can not only go ahead as planned, but in a state that will allow fans to be at the show, which means they're targeting the South, Florida and Georgia, where lockdown measures have been eased this month. To make this happen, WWE might even delay SummerSlam so it takes place in September. September Slam! But WWE's Big Four shows aren't just about the Sunday night pay-per-view. There's also the four-day string of tapings that surround it, with SmackDown on Friday, an NXT TakeOver on Saturday, and Raw on Monday. It turns what would be a one-day event into a weekend-long travel destination, which often attracts a big international fan base flying in. With non-domestic travel restrictions likely to stay in place though, it seems WWE might just be approaching SummerSlam as a one-off night. Especially as Triple H and Shawn Michaels announced NXT TakeOver In Your House for the 7th of June on last night's episode. Which is such a genuinely cool idea, I love that logo. What do you think will happen with SummerSlam? Let me know in the comments down below because I'll be replying to people from out of my bunker! Speaking of things Steve Carino has messed up Segway... The XFL officially filed for bankruptcy last month, reportedly damaging Vince McMahon's business reputation as he invested nowhere near the $300 million he promised his partners. Which is why there's been a whole bunch of lawsuits filed against McMahon and WWE, including one from former XFL CEO and commissioner Oliver All Out of Luck, who is suing Vince personally for breach of contract over his dismissal from the company. More details from the lawsuit have now come out, with McMahon's attorneys arguing, no, it's all his fault. They state Luck was fired for gross neglect of his job during the early days of Steve Carino, for personal use of a league-issued iPhone, but I need to play Raid Shadow Legends, and for signing former NFL player Antonio Callaway, despite orders from McMahon to not sign anybody with troubled legal histories. According to Vince's attorneys, Luck left left the XFL's HQ in Connecticut for his home in Indiana on March 13th, and disengaged from the XFL's operations. Put simply, at the very moment when his leadership as CEO was needed most, Luck did not devote substantially all of his business time to the XFL as required by his contract. And in relation 
to the Callaway signing, Luck failed to promptly terminate Callaway in accordance with McMahon's instructions, which I'm guessing would be in a wrestling ring while screaming, YOU'RE FIRED! And on top of that, Callaway then picked up an injury while in training, which required medical and workers' compensation costs for the league in excess of six figures. Speaking of six figures, that's how much we raised for charity on Quizzlemania 7 last night. If you include the numbers after the decimal point, it's still really good. Thanks to you wonderful viewers and your incredibly generous donations, we raised over £5,000, over $6,000 for No Kid Hungry, which was helped massively by Chopper agreeing to shave off his eyebrows if it went over four grand. Shave us, Chopper. And thank you for sacrificing your beard, eyebrows, and most likely any chance of intercourse for the next few weeks. Hopefully you can grow back this sexy tash in no time. Get it? I, sa I said mo rather than no. Here's last night's episode of AE Dynamite in about four minutes. The murder hawk Lance Archer fittingly opened Dynamite by murdering a random guy. For Jake the Snake Roberts to say he'll apologise to Brandy for putting his snake over her last week, reptile not a penis, when she kisses his ass. He then went on a misogynistic rant, which if you are offended, that's the point, he's a bad guy, to be interrupted by Cody Rhodes revving a nightmare branded 4x4, which he drove about six feet into a barricade. That's like his barricade. He's, he's vice president of that barricade. Sammy Guevara should have just thrown himself in front of it last minute. Weird truck spot aside, Cody and Lance then awesomely brawled around the ring. But while Cody might not have gotten the better of Archer, he did counter several moves, prompting Jake and Lance to back off. This was a great way of giving Cody some heat without undermining Archer's insane threat. Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, he will survive another mass extinction event, then had a really fun face versus face match against the best friends that got all the heels involved for the finish. First Ray Phoenix took out Orange Cassidy, building the casino ladder match, and then MJF and Wardlow beat down Jungle Boy, causing Jurassic Express to lose. Penelope Ford, Britt Baker, Chris Statlander and Shida then had an excellent fast-paced four-way. This is what women's wrestling should be in AEW. Shida beat Ford to set up a match against Nyla Rose at Double or Nothing, while Baker snapped outside and wouldn't let go of the lockjaw on Statlander, also setting up a grudge match between them at the pay-per-view. Two women's storylines at the same time? AEW, stop it! After Santana and Ortiz cost Kenny Omega and Matt Hardy last week's street fight, the two teams clashed here in yet another really fun back and forth match, including one of the best sells I've ever seen for the twist of fate by Santana, which was somehow immediately topped by Sammy Guevara doing the same thing onto a chair while wearing a neck brace, leading to the faces picking up the win. Taz again tried to recruit Darby Allen backstage with his wrestling smarts, courageously making his Return from a potentially career ending thumbnail injury. MJF did all the heel spots against enhancement talent Lee Johnson and made him tap in an armbar. The inner circle looked awesome singing Judas together on Dynamite again, like a drunk bully gang in an 80s post apocalyptic action film. Pineapple Pete tried to beat Chris Jericho with a surprise flurry, but quickly ran into the Judas effect. It's Judas effective! A minute long squash match that technically had a six week long build. Jericho has an incredible skill of making things mean something, a talent he used to great effect in the immediate post-match. Mitch the plant, a scarf, the list, Jericho can get over inanimate objects like they're real people. So when he debuted the Inner Circle's sixth member, a baseball bat called Floyd, and proceeded to bash Hardy's pet drone Vanguard 1 to smithereens with it, there was a tangible grief to what is, out of context, 
a wacky angle. This was massively enhanced when Matt came out to cradle the smashed up Vanguard in his arms like it really was his dying best friend. This was somehow simultaneously the most ridiculous and emotionally investing development in this feud so far. Then in another stroke of genius, AEW announced Mike Tyson will be presenting the TNT title to the winner of the tournament finals at Double or Nothing. It's such an obvious thing to do. The wrestling connection, the Attitude Era spirit AEW often tries to capture the Las Vegas theme, yet Tyson has been rarely used in wrestling outside of his WrestleMania angle. Brody Lee came out with his creepers and stole an AEW championship for a main event with technically a four month build against Christopher Daniels. Brody dominated most of the match until he got involved with the rest of SCU at ringside, which prompted a Dark Order vs. Babyface's brawl. Daniels briefly managed a comeback, but it was cut off with Lee's awesome discus clothesline. To build their double or nothing title match, Moxley then stormed the ring as Lee escaped. That was this week's AEW in about four minutes. Let me know what you thought of the show in the comments down below because I'll be replying to people from out of nowhere. And click the eye above my head to give your rating. A lot of viewers were annoyed last week because I felt uncomfortable giving AEW a rating. It was a very good show, but I struggled to fully invest in it with JR and Roberts at ringside. It wasn't meant to come across as favoritism because I've still been rating Raw and SmackDown. I just didn't know what I thought of it immediately, so I wasn't going to rate it out of five. I found this episode much easier to watch as it didn't have the ethical baggage of being the first AEW taping since lockdown. I still stand by those criticisms, but for this as a wrestling show, I thought it was very well done. The wrestling was great and all the angles worked. This week's Dynamite is a high middle of the road. We've got an interview with Pineapple Pete himself. Click the video on the right to hear him talking about working with Chris Jericho and want to see Shave Chopper. Click the video below that to watch last night's epic Quizzlemania 7 and make WrestleTalk.com your homepage for all the latest wrestling news and get your Piledrive COVID-19 shirt by going to WrestleTalkMerch.com. I've been Ollie Davis and that was wrestling.